And one of the best people knowing about all the scuttlebutt around the NFL is Mike Florio, who joins us on the Harbor One Hotline. Mike is also a new author of a novel, Father of Mine. And I appreciate your time this morning, Mike. How are you? Great to be with you. How are you today? I'm doing great. So we've been trying to figure out, and I know you guys have been discussing a bit with um, Chris Sims on PFT Live about the dynamic that exists with the Patriots ownership and head coach and general manager. I I have sort of gotten to the side where I just believe Bill is in charge of the football operation and Robert Kraft is frustrated or angry or whatever, but not frustrated enough to make a change at that position. Where do you stand on the dynamic of the Patriots' decision-making uh, football uh, team? I think the comments that Robert Kraft made at the league meetings in Arizona in late March were not received with the significance they should have been because he was asked specifically, as Bill Belichick chases the all-time wins record, Will he be able to do that, or does he need to get to the playoffs? I'm paraphrasing, but that was the question. And Robert Kraft didn't say, hey, he's here as long as he wants to be, or hey, he's here until he breaks Don Shula's record or some open anything like that. He said, we want our players to get statistics, but more importantly, we want to win football games. And I got the impression from the way he answered the question that another season of no playoffs could be a major problem for Bill Belichick. And then you've got that issue that I know bubbled up recently, but had been actually commented on earlier, the question of cash spending and Belichick complaining they were at the bottom of the league on a three-year rolling average and Kraft saying, hey, I give the guy whatever he wants. I mean, there's an undercurrent of tension there. Anytime you have losing in a program, you're going to have tension that comes to the forefront. And the question is, how many more losing seasons, how many more non-playoff appearances can Bill Belichick withstand? And we're in uncharted waters here because we've never had a six-time Super Bowl champion who's had things go the other way. What is the grace period when you've had that kind of success? We're seeing it all play out one year at a time. So, Mike, if you feel like the, you know, when Robert says, all right, we need to win here, because I think the conversation that we've been having all morning long, is Robert then not in a position or to step in and go, I want to sign DeAndre Hopkins regardless of price tag. Or is he just completely deferring to Bill, even if he knows a player like D-Hop can help his quarterback and help his team, he's basically saying, I'm stepping away? I think his attitude is, I gave the keys to Bill, he makes those decisions, and he will be held accountable for those decisions if those decisions don't result in the kind of outcome that I want. I mean, he clearly wasn't happy about the Frankenstein monster approach on offense last year, and Kraft has said so multiple times. That's Bill's call. It's all Bill's call. When it works, Bill gets the credit. When it doesn't work, Bill gets the blame. And I think that that attitude makes it very easy when the time comes for changes to be made. If changes need to be made, Kraft can make it obvious to anyone who's paying attention that these decisions were not made by him day in and day out, season in and season out. These are Bill Belichick is the de facto GM and the head coach shaping the team the way he wants it to be shaped and Kraft supporting his vision, whatever it might be. Mike, when it comes to DeAndre Hopkins in particular, the $13 million a year with uh, incentives, is that overpaying for him in your opinion? And do you have any idea of what range or what number the Patriots did offer the him? I remember when Mike Reese of ESPN.com threw out there as an idea 10 million plus two or three million in incentives. For those of us who do this for a living, when you see something like that, your antenna go up as, you know, it, it struck me as someone told him, hey, you know what, don't report this as fact, but if you would say that this is what we're offering, you won't be wrong. So I always looked at that 10 plus two or three more in incentives as kind of what the Patriots were willing to do. And at the end of the day, the Titans were willing to do more. Now, is Bill Belichick going to regret not investing the extra $3 million? Who knows? Who knows how it's going to play out? Who knows what his plan B is? And I, I've always wondered whether or not Bill Belichick was just kind of half-hearted in the pursuit of DeAndre Hopkins anyway, because the way he's handled his business in the past he, he goes quiet, he goes secret, he goes stealth mode, and then he gets the guy. And we didn't even know he wanted him until he got him. I always thought it was odd with Hopkins that it was so well known that the Patriots were interested. I really have wondered, is this a guy that Belichick 
kind of deep down didn't want, and it goes back to the whole culture fit that I'm sure you all have talked about and the practice aversion that Hopkins reportedly has. And, yeah, I, I feel like if Bill really wanted him, he would have gotten him, and we wouldn't have even known he was chasing him until, boom, he has him like on that, that Sunday night in late June three years ago when all of a sudden Cam Newton was a member of the Patriots and we had no idea they were even after him. Oh, man, that's a great point. I mean, you let me look back to guys like Steph Gilmore, who the Patriots swooped in early in free agency, and we hadn't heard word one about him prior to that signing. That's a good point. Same about, happened with Revis, too. Right. Mm-hmm. Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk, joins us. Just curious of the the national view of the Patriots. I I am I, I, I just – I am shocked as a guy that lives here and has watched Belichick his whole run here with the Patriots that he hasn't been more competitive to try and win quicker because of what it means for his legacy. What's your view and in, in, in the national view of, of him and, and where this team is headed? Well, I think he's been diminished the past few years without Tom Brady. It all comes down to the quarterback. Who do you have a quarterback, and is that quarterback putting you in a position where you can make playoff appearances and be successful when you get there? And in that whole Brady-Belichick dynamic, the one thing that I think we overlooked is that Brady morphed into a different kind of competitor when it was time to go out there and win in the postseason. And the more experience he got, the better he got in those postseason games. He was just supremely confident he was going to find a way, and he kept doing it and doing it, and now they don't have that guy. And I think we're seeing the, the effects of it. And when you look around the AFC, you look around the AFC East, I mean, it used to be the Patriots for the Globetrotters and the other three teams for the Washington Generals now they're all globetrotters. And right now on paper, the Patriots are the worst team in the division. Now, that doesn't mean Bill Belichick can't coach them into third place or second place. But, they, hey, those teams in the AFC East this year, they play all four teams from the AFC West, all four teams from the NFC East. They play each other twice. There's a good chance only one of those teams is getting to the playoffs, and that's going to be the division champion. There may not be a wild card coming out of that division. It's a tough division. It's a tough conference. And right now, I, put, I did this a few weeks ago. I started listing the teams. For me, the Patriots came up number eight out of 16 in the AFC. Well, perfectly, okay. perfectly average. Uh, a quick, you mentioned Brady. Um, over the weekend, Antoine Winfield Jr. was on a podcast, I think, with Richard Sherman. And he speculated or threw out there that there was a chance they would still call Brady. Brady's done, right? He's not, he's not coming back again, Mike. Back in 2008, when Brett Favre retired the first time, he was on David Letterman's show in late April. And Letterman was prodding him about whether he would come back. And at the time, we had no idea Brett Favre was coming back. This was before he retired and then retired and retired and then retired. But he said, I have no idea how I'm going to feel when training camp starts. And to me, that was the lightning bolt moment. It was like, this guy is coming back. And with Brady, who has been playing football almost his entire life, right? Let's assume he started at age 10, 35 years of football. This is the first time since he first put on a helmet that the train is leaving the station without him. And it's going to roll away without him. And the football world is going to go on without him. And does he know how he's going to feel when that train starts to move? I don't think he knows. So how can we know? how he's going to feel when, you know, he's got himself in a position where he's a free agent. He can sign with anyone. He said years ago, I'll retire when I suck. He clearly doesn't suck. He told Jim Gray when pressed on that point, I believed it when I said it. And it dawned on me then, boy, that's a powerful statement. You can change your mind on anything you want as long as you're willing to say, I believed it when I said it. So he, he said he's done. If he comes back, all he has to say is, I believed it when I said it. So to me, the bottom line is what goes on inside of him once training camps are open, once games are being played, how's he going to feel? And he's going to be able to deal with not being part of it when he knows there's plenty of guys playing that aren't nearly as good as him right now. Mike, when you look at this Patriots team, and you talked about some of the things that we've heard Kraft say, uh, you know, from the owners, meaning one of them was winning a playoff game. What do you believe happens to Bill or Kraft's decision if the Patriots don't make the playoffs this year and win a playoff game, what do you think Kraft's dis- you know, ultimately does next season? I think if they don't make the playoffs, Bill Belichick's in real danger. And I think Kraft, on multiple occasions, has given us enough that we could come to that conclusion. He was talking a couple of weeks ago like the only way he gets satisfaction this year is with a seventh Super Bowl win. I mean, I, that's, that's unrealistic for where this team is and what's going on in the rest of the conference, but that's his bar. So if they don't make the playoffs, I think it could be a major problem for Bill Belichick. If they make the playoffs and go one and out like they did two years ago, 47-17 to the Bills, 
that could be a problem as well. But here's the other side of the coin. When it's time to make the change, who's he going to hire? Who does he have in mind? Is it as simple to say it's going to be Gerard Mayo and let's just hand the whistle to him and move forward? Is there someone else he's thinking about? But if you're going to move on from the guy you have, if you're going to give up the bird in the hand, you better be confident that the guy you bring in is going to give you better outcomes than the guy that you parted ways with. Mike, how important is it of a season for Mac Jones? You talk about Bill, Be- Bill Belichick and the, the pressure on him, but for Mac now having Billy O'Brien, how much pressure is on him to, to be leaps better than he was last season? Oh, it's critical. And look, it wasn't his fault entirely last year because the offense was abysmal, but he developed that reputation and that attitude of a guy who would act like a brat on the sidelines. And I think it's great. Anytime any of the Patriots behave differently than – the way that they're programmed by Bill to behave, I think it's awesome. But there was a ton of tension last year between Belichick and Mac Jones over the offensive coordinator that he was stuck with, what it did to his development, and there's pressure on him this year to really show that he's the guy, especially if there's any chance of a coaching change. If there's a new coach, you're going to have to prove it to him too, and you're going to have to do enough this year to, to, to get that guy on board. And I think it's hand-in-hand. If Jones doesn't play well, the team doesn't play well, and it runs the risk of change, which would mean Mac Jones may not be part of the solution, whatever the solution is after 2023. All right, Mike. Thanks for the time. I know you've got a new book out. You want to discuss uh, what, what is Father of Mine and uh, what, what, what did you uh, aim to get accomplished in your first novel as an author? Uh, Father of Mine is a mob novel set in 1973 in the town I grew up in where there was prevalent mob activity. My dad was actually a bookie working for the mob there. So I saw a lot of stuff, learned a lot of stuff, and I took that as a background for a story that's completely fictionalized. There's nothing about it that actually happened, although some of the events in the book uh, become, you know, are traced back to things that actually did occur. All the characters are made up and and, and whatnot, but it's... Uh, I try to make it a page turner. I try to make it a nice, easy summary. I, I, for anybody else. Oh, man. That's bad timing. Mike, uh, I think we lost you, but I appreciate the time. Oh, I think, no, I think you dropped. But.